Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'll be introducing your speaker. Your moderator tonight will be uh, Andy Anderson. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes tonight. The college consists of the following format. We'll have a brief announcements period. Then we will have our speaker who will be speaking tonight. Let me borrow your schedule for a minute. Our speaker tonight will be uh, David Williams III. Okay, David Williams III. And David is a eight-time decorated U.S. Navy Iraqi Freedom War vet, novelist, 2014 GOP congressional candidate, and 2016 independent congressional candidate in ninth and in the ninth district and libertarian in the spirit of liberty he aims to serve the american people and their interest not political party bosses or multinational globalist corporations equal protection under the law not favoritism lower taxes term limits and fighting to maintain the constitutional values that make this country great in other words keep the government out of your pocketbook and out of your bedroom <laughs> Which I learned, right? Here we go. I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, David Earl Williams III. Let's welcome. All right, gentlemen, thank you for having me here tonight. My name is David Earl Williams III. So I'm a U.S. Navy veteran, novelist, model promoter, political activist, humanitarian, and most importantly, I'm a libertarian. And I'm running for the nomination for the Libertarian uh, Party of Illinois uh, Lieutenant Governor. A little bit about myself, as I mentioned before, I was uh, in the U.S. Navy, but I was stationed in Yokosuka, Japan uh, from 2002 to 2006. Uh, my first two years, I was what they called a deck seaman, so I was driving the ship and doing the painting and all that fun stuff. In my last two years, I was actually in charge of over uh, $2 billion worth of aviation equipment and under 20 personnel. Uh, they called that a storekeeper at the time, but now they're logistics specialists. They're changing the names to all these uh, jobs in the military all of a sudden. Can't even keep up with it. So I went to uh, Canada after my time in the Navy. I studied abroad there for two years. I spent four years there. I was doing criminal justice at first, but then I was like, you know, I don't even want to get involved with uh, anything dealing with the uh, criminal aspect. I was like, I want to have a life, so I was like, yeah, I'm just going to do uh, general studies, and I'm okay with that, getting an associate's degree with that. Uh, then I came back to the U.S. in 2010, and I started getting involved politically with a group called We Are Change Chicago. And uh, I was formerly with the Republican Party for a while there. Oh I have to apologize God. for that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's always something I always apologize for. And I made my way to the Libertarian Party eventually. But uh, So I ran for Congress in 2014 in Illinois' 9th Congressional District against uh, Jan Schakowsky. But I lost my primary by 1,427 votes, so I raised about $55,000 for my first run, and I was pretty uh, happy with that. And the second time, uh, 2016, I ran for the same office as an independent. It didn't go so well, so I was like, you know, I can't do this on my own, so I'm going to you know, be with the Libertarian Party and try to build this party up. Instead of having uh, the choices of there being just Democrats and Republicans, you know, because you look around the rest of the world, when it comes to their politics, they have choices when it comes to multiple parties instead of just the two-party system. And you can't say that, oh, I agree with everything the Republican Party says or everything the Democratic Party says because I don't think anyone can honestly uh, say that. You know, there, you, there's no such thing as being an absolutist. And um, there, there are some things I, I disagree with the Libertarian Party, but I feel more inclined to uh, stick around with them. And the reason why I'm running for lieutenant governor, you know, the party themselves, they wanted me to run for governor. Uh, and I was like, you know, I, I feel there are just as qualified individuals, and we have three candidates who are doing that, and I'll just name them real quick. Uh, you have uh, Cash Jackson, he's a uh, Navy veteran of 20 years, and you have Matthew Scarrow and uh, John Stewart as well. That's not the comedian. Uh, so, yeah, there's a guy named John Stewart. <laughs> so, myself, I feel that lieutenant governor position is actually closest to the people. And instead of just getting bogged down with the bureaucracy of Springfield, I could actually go out there and see what's on people's minds. And I could tell you a little bit, real quickly, what the duties of Lieutenant Governor carries. And that isn't just uh, besides the fact of trying to take the governor's position if they get impeached or go to prison. Because Illinois is very known for that, the governorship. So um, you end up being the chairman of the uh, Governor's Rural Fair Council. So this is pretty much trying to give a better quality life for those who live in rural Illinois and potentially bring jobs down south. Uh, the Rural Bond Bank serves as a conduit for local governments 
to use funds uh, for public improvement and uh, at a low cost. The River Coordinating Council maintains the cleanliness of Illinois rivers. So I'm not against the EPA existence, so I think in this state we're going to keep that. Uh, and yeah, Main Street programs, bringing in business, you know, trying to keep, organize, promote, design, and economic restoration. And then when it comes to Main Street, especially when it comes to the uh, urban areas and rural areas that are impoverished the most, I always personally do believe that if we had economic freedom zones, if we lowered the tax rate in those areas, you'd see more jobs in there. But for that to occur also, too, I think that to get people from doing criminal activities in, in those areas, we need to end the war on drugs. And I do feel that we also need to decriminalize the harder substances, because I look at a state like Oregon who is doing this. I don't believe that if you're making a uh, conscious choice of doing something like cocaine, for example, you need to be locked up in a cage uh, with rapists and murderers. You most definitely might need help if you get addicted, but to be locked away, no. I, I at least very least a fine, but uh, I do believe in uh, doing those things. So, this is, you know, low taxation is one reason why I'm doing it as well, because we are taxed enough as it is. And this state is losing business. A lot of people are moving out. I don't blame them. And, you know, if, if we're going to have the argument, just say, for example, that higher taxes are going to bring in more revenue, well, people are leaving. You know, we could just decriminalize the drugs and uh, legalize marijuana, and that would make up for that. But let, let's say, for example, if we're talking about taxation, and let's say you're making, let's see, 100000 a year. If federally, it's what, 35% if you're making over a certain amount, that goes towards the federal government. And you're paying 35000 pretty much, because that's 35% of 100000 Now, if you're making, let's say, $36,000 a year, 35%, Estimate you're, you're giving about thirteen thousand dollars back to the federal government, and if you're making twenty-eight thousand dollars, you're making close to uh, that was a nine thousand eight hundred dollars right there. So who, so being taxed more, who's it really hurting? Is it hurting someone who is being productive? For the most part, I mean, there are greedy rich people. Don't get me wrong; I don't think they all have uh, our interests in mind. But when you look at someone who's struggling to try to meet ends meet, they're going to hurt the most. And I come from a working poor family, a single mother, being raised along with two sisters, an older brother, and I've seen that. And I do personally believe in a temporary means uh, of welfare, you know, to get back on your feet. I'm not looking to abolish that. I know, but I, I can't believe someone's saying this, right? But, you know, from my own experience, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. But I, I do feel that if we see more job growth, I do feel that if people are, once again, motivated to go out there, if the jobs are worth it, you know, you don't have to have the need to, uh, forever be on welfare, but I'm not looking to get rid of it though. So now I'm just ranting. I think I've said what I had to say, and I'd be so happy to take questions. And uh, you know, I thank you so much for having me here again. Where do you agree and disagree with Gary Johnson? Where do I agree and disagree with him? Well, I mean, the, the obvious, like most libertarians would be for uh, in the drug war. Yeah, um, you know, I can't really think of anything. Well, no, there's something I do disagree with him. What he did was uh, he was in favor of the TPP, and I'm happy to see that. You know, that was scrap because um, it was a bad deal. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Um, you wrote on your on your card here: promote voting rights awareness uh, for ex felons. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, in this state. There's a lot of people who are unaware that if you had a criminal record, that you can vote. Because okay. they, they don't know they can vote. So okay. they, I think there needs to be a mass awareness. That if they have shown, obviously, they spent their time in jail, that they are uh, capable citizens, they should be able to be, uh, to be a part of uh, our constitutional republic, representative democracy, to take place to vote for the candidates uh, that they feel can represent them the most. Because a lot of people don't know this in this state. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yes. Governor Rauner made us a sanctuary state. Do you agree with that? You know, I'm not looking to uh, take away people who come over here, you want to call it, them being illegally un undocumented, but they do provide a lot for the local economy when it comes to them going to in the marketplace, the, the stores, whatever, to pay their taxes. I don't blame them personally for coming to America to. Well, do the jobs that most Americans won't do. And I don't see many Americans wanting to work at currency exchanges or mow lawns and all that. So uh, I, 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 could say, I could tell you honestly, uh, 
unless they have murdered someone, and it's, it's, I feel it's a serious crime like that, yeah, then they should be deported, but if they're just trying to make a simple living, no, I have no interest in trying to go after them. So I will agree with them on that issue. Uh, yes. Yeah, David, uh, the libertarian, you're talking there about equitable distribution of wealth. An equitable distribution of wealth would mean you take from the rich and give to the poor. Is that what you advocate? You mean by using force to do that? Or take talk, from the rich some, and some give form of to taxation? the poor. Are you against so. that? Are you for it? Let me see here. I'm trying to understand. So you're talking about using force so to you're take. you're talking about taxes. <coughs> okay. Well, I would be against high taxes. I already make that clear. What's that? High taxes. I'm against high taxation. So rich people shouldn't get high taxes. <coughs> the rich people seem like they can afford it when people who are like myself who are struggling are trying to make ends meet. And I would like to actually have a little bit of that money in my pocket. So in, in the ideal world, I would love to see no taxation whatsoever, but I'm not going to... Uh, be unrealistic and say, I, I do feel, and some libertarians might disagree with me, that I do feel there's some, some form need, at least on the state level, but federally I'd love to see a scrap. Because it's being wasted on, well, federally it's being wasted on uh, an overblown military, and that's all your money. Why would you want your money going towards something that's uh, causing people in other countries who we have, we, we have no uh, business being over there, we're making more enemies and, ter and terrorism wow. increase. So you are against, and I don't want to summarize it, I'll leave it at this, you are against a progressive <coughs> Oh, yeah. I, I think we're much better off with the uh, flat tax we have here. All right. Yeah. You don't want to have anything like that. Okay. Next one question, please. Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for being here this evening. If. We have a LaSalle Street tax here in Chicago, a tax of one one thousandth of one percent of the sales of derivatives. Uh, it could raise approximately ten billion dollars a year for much needed human services, uh, especially for public education, senior services, disability <coughs> services, veteran services. Um, could you talk about how taxes like that, where it would already be to a demographic that's super rich. So the super rich will be near super rich. The, rear, the rich will be near rich then if that tax is implemented. And the near rich will still be better off than 85% of the population. So to me, that's a graduated tax, I guess they call it. Now, is there a middle ground there between people on the left and people that are on the right to agree? Those whose cups are flowing over they can afford to contribute back a little bit more. Is there a middle ground there? Because I'm trying to find a middle ground. Well, I think if people are going to contribute, give them money for these programs, the state programs, they would voluntarily do it. Well, you have to keep in mind, who are the people that are currently serving in government? These are the rich. Are, are they going to raise taxes on themselves? No, there's probably going to be some loop open. They give a nice campaign speech. That's like even looking at the federal Congress. They've always talked about doing this. But they don't want to lose their donors. I would hate to say it, you know, for people who advocate this view, but it's kind of like a pipe dream because, again, if you're going to put rich people in there who have it, and they and they say these nice things that make it sound nice, it's just not going to happen. Because how are they going to get reelected? And uh, again, I just go back to getting revenue from other places for the schools, for example, because we've always had this argument about we raise taxes, the schools are going to be funded. Well, we've seen recently what happened when it came to this budget issue. It's temporarily being funded, but it's just going to be the same thing next time. If you have like a Bruce Romer, you have a J.B. Prisker in there, a billionaire who can't relate to you and I on our struggles, uh, I don't see that realistic happen. to be honest. This is a quick follow-up. Yeah. Uh, that ten billion dollars a year, um, that's that's ten billion dollars a year of, of revenue that I I still feel this is the most reasonable suggestion I have yet to hear from anyone on the political spectrum, whether left or right, because of the fact that it's coming from a place where no one will be hurting as far as business creation or job creation. Uh, these are super super rich people who will then just be near super rich. So for them, it's just a slight percentage, but for working class and middle class communities in Illinois, that would be a huge boost. 
Right. So it resonates with middle class and working class okay. communities across the state. Well, here's something I've always advocated too. And personally, if you're going to elect people to office, you know, you always want them to have your best interests in mind. But you shouldn't be paying um, these current politicians. It's like Lieutenant Governor gets paid 129000 to nearly 135000 for what? To run the state into the ground? And Bruce Rodder, who's already a millionaire himself, and we can argue if he's getting this $174,000 salary, or if he's giving it to his wife to have a chief of staff when she never won office. You, you see how the money's being funneled? I, I do feel that if you want to keep people honest, and you want to see the money coming from somewhere where it's going to be used in meaningful programs such as obviously public education. I went to a public school. I'm not looking forward to getting rid of any of that whatsoever. So I do feel that the uh, all the way from the state executive branch, uh, they should, and you know, the general assembly, they should be paid the uh, what well, Illinois uh, median income, which is currently fifty-seven thousand dollars, all across the board, and then you can take some of the money from there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, yes. What is your thoughts on gun control here in Illinois? Okay, and this 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 is the question I was looking forward to most. So in our state, we currently have uh, when it comes to background checks, we have the uh, criminal background check, which they do through the FBI database. They also have a mental health record. You know, if you've ever been locked up or whatever and been treated for such issues, um, I believe I want to say it's 32 states that currently do this. Now, when it comes to because I've seen the debates when it comes to like, when well, Illinois is a gun license, there's no gun license here for the state, but they, they have to go through the ATF to even sell a gun in the first place. And, and because there's no need to, they have a Illinois state uh, retailer license when you could, you, you're going through the federal government is what I'm trying to say, that every gun reseller must do this. And you look at Chicago, most of the violence again is, you know, a lot of it's gun related, but I mean, that involves the drugs too. And you know, this is something outside of the scope of uh, what government can do, but I mean, a lot of broken families. And I think as society, this is something that has to be rediscovered where you, know, you start taking care of your kids. And it doesn't help when the schools are being closed down by Bruce Rauner, by the way. I mean, they, they need somewhere to be educated. We all can't go to charter schools and things, or private schools. But yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in favor of the Second Amendment. I'm not going to waver from that. I'm pretty sure people are going to disagree with that here. That's fine. But I do feel that you look at places where there are more guns, there is less crime. I'm not saying there's a perfect world out there. But you, you get rid of that, for example, let's say hypothetically we do this, you're going to see an increase in crime. You look at places like Australia, and this is statistically proven, there's high cases of rape of women. How's a woman going to defend herself if she wants to have a gun? She, wants, she doesn't have the option anymore. I mean, you go to places like the UK, they do have a high increase of uh, stabbings. I mean, we can make the argument saying that, oh, knife is less deadlier than a gun. Well, maybe so, but I mean, criminal activity is still going to be out there, and you're just taking away that opportunity for law-abiding citizens, which is 33% of, of gun owners in the U.S. that exist, to be able to act out the Second Amendment to defend themselves. Now, we could say that, well, it's, you know, Second Amendment is outdated, right? We could say that it was only meant for muskets. But then you, you can make the argument saying that, well, um, you know, freedom of speech was only for the print and press and carrier pigeon too, and the internet shouldn't be, you know, should be regulated. I don't believe the internet should be regulated though, because it's a great way to get past the mainstream media to uh, have your voice heard. So, you know, it's a uh, debate that I always welcome. I like opposing views when it comes to the Second Amendment, because it's unfortunate that you, you have these activities happen where innocent people get gunned down. And let it be at a school or some concert and and, and you know, it bothers me. I don't think anyone wants to wake up like, well, today I want to get shot. No one, no one should have to live like that. But at the same time, you're just hurting those who aren't a part of the problem. Okay. Uh, in the back. Oh, yeah, my, uh, my loony neighbor <laughs> has a number of weapons. It's rather disconcerting to me. And according to your car, you advocate legalized continual carry, carry around. So not only do I guess you think it's okay for my loony neighbor to, to have weapons, He's, you think he should take these weapons anywhere he wants in the city of Chicago and imagine himself to be some sort of law enforcement officer? or have life or death decisions over other people 
So yeah, we look is at the places. You, we, we look at the places where what are you they gonna, have. Wait a minute. What are you going to do? We look at, and let me answer your question. We look at the places where they have the strong gun rights in Texas. Again, less crime because you're able to defend yourself. Um, now that's your personal opinion. You think he's loony for him having all these weapons? And, you know, you might think the guy might be loony if he has a, a large porn stash. I don't know. You know, that's his business. Uh, as long as he's not going around killing anyone with it, he might be able to protect you. Something you never know. Until he kills me. Right? Right? You don't know. He might protect you too. You never know. He might have your house broken into. <laughs> Wait a minute. You say he can go wherever he wants. What they do it? In, they they do it in the very uh, strong. Uh, gun rights states and there's less crime compared to Chicago which which is unfortunate I call this place my home I I was born in Everson I grew up in uptown Chicago I, I, I always will love the city but you know to try to pretend that magically uh, if we ban guns well there will be no such thing as crime and like the, the little criminals off the streets they won't go get us somewhere else like, illegally it's not like they could walk into a, a store like oh here's my FOI card let me get a gun automatically no there's background checks and you know, and in the case, and, and uh, hold on, in the case of what happened recently with the, um, oh geez, um, the, the individual, I'm, I'm trying, there's so many of this unfortunately happened. The, the recent gun uh, yeah. incident. Yeah, um, talking to one. Texas, so, sure. Texas right? So in, in Texas. Yeah. Well, that, that you, here, here's, the, here's how government can't fail you though. This man was in the Air Force. He had a, multiple of the issues, a, cr a criminal record, even a mental health issue. They failed to even submit that. You know, your background checks are in place. They can only work if the government does their part. This is why this guy uh, did what he did, because he was able to get past the system. If they were responsible, this would have never happened in the first place. That man would have never gotten the gun. But now you, you have these innocent people who were killed. And it, I wouldn't even go as far as saying this, not to be crass, but for, so, for those who are on the left, and you, you see this... Uh, recent activity with some of these people on the right who are calling for violence, how do you think you're going to defend yourself if they come up to you and they do try to attack you? Are, are you going to smack them? Are you going to try to punch them when they're going to draw their guns on you? I'm not saying for calling for violence here, but you do have a right to defend yourself. So you might want to think about that. Uh, yes? Can I get a follow-up to this? What do you think of these 20-year-old sex charges? Don't all men have something in their background? You know? What are you talking about, the Congress? Congress, Congress for politicians. All, all the politicians. Accusations. Like Trump, there's 14 women made a charge yesterday. Yeah, well, I mean, it's concerning. You know, again, you put these people in the office. Why would you want something like that to represent you? And then, you know, and then you look on the other side, there's a lot of cases of these female young teachers sleeping with little boys. But there's going to be a double standard. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be a double, right, there's going to be a double standard to that, though, because it's a young female. And most young men, I'm, that's their dream to have, you know, to do those things with older women, first of all. But, <laughs> but you, you know what? We, we have a law in place, you know. If they're under a certain age, if they're a minor, and you're put in that position of authority, just like there's a male in Congress, it doesn't matter if he or she is a senator, and if you're a teacher in that position of power, you're, you're breaking the law. You deserve to go to jail. So I wouldn't care if you're a man or a woman. You shouldn't be there. You deserve to get locked up. More. You want the same crime equal time, you're going to get that. Because, you know, for God's sakes, these are kids they're talking about here. They don't know what they want. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Take care. Do you think there should be uh, regulations on the correct way to wear a cap? I'm sorry? Um, do, you, do you think there should be regulations on the correct way to wear a cap? I, I could wear a cap. Legislation on the correct way to wear a cap? Cap? Such as sure. backwards. You know, like when oh, you're talking about like, 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 like a hat or a sag and pants or something. <laughs> I don't know, that's something I guess the local and listen pallies can do. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I have a question. You, I know what you mentioned on your card here. You, 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 you use the term parental rights reformation, mm -hmm. and you, which you, you say you support. Yeah. What, what does parental rights reformation mean? Well, we have a governor, Ken Cash Jackson, who's very strong, and there's a lot of things I agree with, especially, for example, that you, you find that if you have a certain amount of money, you might actually be a better parent if, you, if you're lacking those funds. The courts can usually uh, be in favor of that parent who has more money. They, they might neglect the child. My own sister has been through this as well. And in regards to, like, visitation rights, you know, I think it should be 50-50. I don't think it should be, like... The kid or children should be with one parent all the time. Uh, that's why I'm in favor of those things. I think if you're going to be given uh, out child support money and the parent who has the child in that care, 
they should be able to prove actually what they're spending the money on because they currently don't do this. I mean, if, it's, if, it, if the money's going towards the child, let's be able to prove this so we keep everyone accountable. Oh, so you want to make it more difficult for moms to, to, to be able to get child support? Well, there are fathers who get child support and abuse this the very same way as well. So it goes both ways, though. Because I was with a single mother. My father paid up every cent. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, we want to make it fair because it's not just one parent having the child either. If it's the child's in the custody of the mother, the child's custody of the father, there's two parents. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, well, you, most of the time, they do end up, you know, it ends up being, the, most of the time it ends up being the mom who gets custody. Not in all cases because my sister that? didn't end up with the child and she, the father did. And I don't want to put people on blast here. I, I, just, I had to personally say this. I'm going to come to her defense though. Because that's absolute BS right there. Because my sister was well capable of taking care of the child, her my nephew, but he ended up with the, the little boy. And he has his own family on the side, started his own family on the side, and it's the grandparents who takes care of the kids. The grandparents, not him. That's his responsibility. The grandparents, his mother and father, did not have that kid. And that, that is the most why I feel so passionate when it comes to at least talking about this issue. Because if, if we're going to say that it needs to be equality, we're going to, we, we can't have a double standard like, oh, it's a hot teacher, let her off. You know, it's some guy that has sex with a little girl, let, you know, he's, he's terrible, we need to castrate him. You know, things like that, no, that needs to change because this mindset is not going to get us anywhere. And especially when it comes to parental reformation. Uh, hey, yes, this girl. Yes. Oh, sorry. No, she, she had a, you had a question? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, just, I forgot. Oh, okay, um, I just was, I don't know, go ahead. Um, how do you feel about the, the ridiculous gun charge that be against the youth that get caught like with a weapon or the 10-year gun charge? Yeah, the 10-year gun charge. How do you feel about that? Just, just strictly having a gun on you? Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. And you get locked up. And, and, you're, and you're not committing a crime, right? It's just, no, just it's for just carrying. a gun law for carrying an um, undocumented, unregistered gun. So, now, if, if I have to ask them, that, or did they buy this? Off or did the they streets. just have it on them? They bought it off the streets. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's illegal if they just got off the streets, then obviously. But, that's what you're trying to say. Yes, I they, 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 they buy it off the years. streets. The ten, yes, the 10 years. Well, I don't think, I, well, how long? If I may ask, how long would you say, in general, the max of punishment to get for that? I don't believe they're that given, uh, they're given 10 years by 10 law, years. but what if a 16-year-old is found with something like that? Or 18-year-old? He's not going to get out of jail until 10 years later because of the infested in community that he's living in. Right. And it's like he's, he's living in a, in a, a community and environment where guns are being shipped and transported through his community, so it's easy as access to a weapon. That's the reason why I'm asking, like, how do you feel about the ridiculous um, charges towards youth that get caught with a weapon? And they, like, and what's I, your take on that? And, and I just want to make it clear, they're not, they haven't used this to go shoot anyone. They, they've just no, been caught no. with it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And, and they just got this Ill, illegally, obviously, right? Yeah. Well, I don't think you should be doing 10 years or any, any nonsense like that. I mean, maybe a fine, but it's not, not killing you. Right? That's what I personally think. Okay. That's the first time I ever heard that question, by the way. That's a good one, too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Cubs or Sox fan? <laughs> oh, <no>. Come on. <laughs> it's We're an important today. question. Come on. Stupid. What about the Warriors? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. We got certainly, certainly we got more questions in here. Yeah. Right here. How do you feel about uh, how do you feel about the uh, listing things on uh, government documents that record uh, gender and eye color and height and weight? And like, is that sort of stuff necessary on state IDs? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's important to have the gender. I mean, they, no, I don't, I don't see the point, really. So driver's license should only just be like, so you're okay, like if, like if somebody does not identify as a man anymore, you would be... It doesn't bother me, either. I don't see the point of having it on there. Yes? Well, how, how would you get rid of the welfare state? Because Obama had 90 million people under the welfare, unemployment and such. Yeah, well, I think when it comes to, going back to when I was talking about, for example, uh, one of the views the lieutenant governor was being working with Main Street, you know, the community and the business has come together. So, you know, bringing in jobs and low taxation, I mean, people want to come to the state, you know, based on a reasonable comfort. 
uh, because, you know, Bruce Rodner, he's talking about, oh, I, at first he's talking about, you know, bringing Amazon to Chicago, but you can't forget about people down south such as in Bloomington where businesses can grow there. I mean, everyone wants to come to Chicago, but if you just spread out those businesses, everyone has a fair chance, I believe. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Okay. As a corollary, uh, you know, and this isn't really talked about much by the Republicans and things, corporate welfare, tax breaks for companies coming into a town, uh, what Ayn Rand would call the moochers of society. How do you feel about that, and do you have any specific remedies to the problem? Yeah, abolish corporate welfare. I would, I would do that way before I would ever do the uh, other welfare. So, I would abolish corporate welfare. I mean, why, why are you giving your money to a business that's failing? Uh, thank you all. No, and they, everyone, and Pete, you have the nerve with some Republicans. <laughs> I, I, I like to pick on them because I used to be with them. You know, they, they feel that if you're on welfare, some sort of mood. It's like, oh, that, you know, but a lot of people, they they need that to get back on their feet. Okay, it's, I mean, if you're living on right. it, issue that. But I think it's a good social safety net because again, I was on it myself at one time too. I'm not on it anymore. I'm working. I'm a capable uh, adult to do so. So you advocate some kind of a safety net, mm. temporary yep. assistance for people. No, if a business can't cut it, go bankrupt to a large degree, correct? It's just too bad for them. Right. That's how I personally felt for the businesses. And, you know, I, I do believe that, you know, with the 10th and 9th Amendment when it comes to state rights, you know, that's something that the federal government would uh, shine upon. But, you know what, uh, the federal government could go stick it. That's how I feel when it comes to that issue. Okay. We uh, have plenty of time for questions. You got you got one out? Okay. How do you feel about public funding for outreach programs in public neighborhoods? I'd rather see the money go towards that. Yeah, I think it's very helpful. I mean, you know, we have nonprofits and you know, you know, voluntary going to do that too, but I would actually love to see money go towards that. There's another one in there. No, Tom, here. Yes. I noticed in, in a little bio here, you said you're a novelist. Have, yes. uh, have you published any novels? One book. Uh, it was a, a screen, well, it was a playwright, sorry. Uh, it was back in, we got it published in 2007. And it was called uh, Valor Tale, you can find it on Amazon. So here, here's a story about that. When I was in high school, I went to Nicholas Sim High School on the north side of Chicago, over in Edgewater. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was about my junior year, no, it's my sophomore year in high school. I started having this constant, like, I'm going to write a book, right? Yeah, but, you know, let it sit on the shelf for a while. But uh, by hand, it was originally like 305 pages, and eventually when I had enough money, I got into the Navy, I was able to publish it before I got out. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, did you talk about job creation in Illinois as far as high speed rail, renewable energy? Infrastructure, broadband. Uh, what do you see as the future of Illinois jobs? What do I see the future of Illinois jobs? Uh, you know, I'm open. To, maybe this comes into what you want to hear, but I'm open to all forms of energy, even like uh, <coughs> solar. I mean, Tesla. Obviously, I, I do like Tesla, so I think that'd be great to see if they would ever come here and have more plants. Um, yeah, yeah, I like Tesla. Um, Stuck on this. <laughs> That's what I have to say. Okay. Yes. Uh, have you ever heard about something called the thorium molten salt reactor, or not? No. Okay. No, I just, it just, I'll, I'll explain after. All right. Uh, more questions. We've got plenty of time. Yeah. Yes. Do, don't you think? Uh, don't you think concealed carry is going to result in a lot of unnecessary shootings? Well, I mean, if that's the case, you see it in Texas, there would be a lot of unnecessary shootings there. There's anywhere down south where those laws are prevalent. I mean, look, you know, gun safety is important, too. I mean, you just can't go toying around with it because it's not a toy. I mean, there are classes out there. I mean, I think anyone who's going to get a gun needs to understand that, you know, this is meant for defense. If you're going to commit a crime, you're most definitely going to have the law against you. Yes. David, every week, there's been reports of mass shootings, and I presume you might have caught news of one of them. And then you come along and you advocate 
greater distribution of weapons within our communities. Is that a sagacious policy you're advancing? Is that what you're encouraging? Is that your response? It is a moral obligation. Is, is if that you your response? Yourself, you should go shootings? do that. If you want to defend more yourself, guns, because uh, the majority of yeah. Chicagoans and Illinoisans are not gang bangers. They're not people off the streets trying to hurt you. If you if you're the type who wants people to break into your house and wait in the corner for about 11 to 22 minutes for the police to come save you, you could go and do that. You probably end up dead by that time that happens. And here, here's the most interesting thing I find out about this argument. And, you know, it's not every cop, because I've had family members who are cops and friends as well. But there, there is a case of police brutality, so it never makes sense to me when someone raises this argument. Like, why would you want to just depend on the cops to come save you when you do yourself, but yet we have an issue with police brutality when they're beaten up by minorities? Why would you want to do that? I mean, you should be able to defend yourself. I'm not saying make this like a wild west, but I mean, you, you do have a moral obligation to defend yourself there. Are you you saying, wish to act that out. Are you it, yes. saying we should get rid of the police? Can I should nope, go I'm not saying that. Next, next question. Okay, listen, hold on. I think I have a question. Wait, 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 yeah. yeah. Good. How do I feel Good. about the private, I mean, do the you private have, do you ownership? Well, do you believe that a person, that let's say, let's say a person who doesn't, uh, a private citizen, uh, who who is not, let's say, a member of the National Guard or some other uh, uh, group like that, should be able to apply for and get a permit to own an AR-15? You know what an AR-15? Yeah, I know. Okay, yeah. sure. Okay, do you believe that a private citizen should be able to um, should be able to apply for and get a permit to own an AR-15? Why not? Well, well the question, my <laughs> question is... But, my but, question, but, they, but they're applying for a permit, so the government not? already knows they have it. So no, no, no. I, my I question, rather don't. than saying why not, my question would be why? Why would a, why would a private citizen, again, who's not part of the National Guard, need to own an AR-15. Why should they own the car? Why should they have access to internet? Well, the car, well, the access to the internet is so you can, so you can, uh, so you can. But that's a luxury. That's the, a luxury. I think we should regulate that. Uh, uh, and uh, we should, we okay. should be able to, uh, you can't go on any website one, and we should be able to tell you what to do. Okay, but, I mean, you, okay, some, but what if, would if you, you have do? access to the internet, you, you could <coughs> what, potentially be a pedophile sure. and might harm kids. Sure, so but we what have to protect would you use? That. What, would, what kind of, what would you use an AR-15 for? Uh, in, in a manner that's not illegal. Uh, defense. Deer hunting. Defense. Deer Mobs of people with tiki torches <laughs> coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> Nazis. Nazis. Yeah, use them in A company of red coats. They <laughs> <laughs> come at you all at once. Uh, <laughs> we can the old days when they yeah. made the law. Right. Doesn't this open up the whole question about mental illness? I mean, this is what we're witnessing over here. All the, the shooting going on. We've like 200 soldiers cut today this, this year, especially this year. I mean, is there anything in the future that you think the government can do, I mean, through legislature, to try to alleviate this problem by uh, trying to mm -hmm. help these people before, before they Right. Get well, I mean, the government can't I mean, read people's minds or predict future events, but, you know, that's why the, the mental health records and the uh, background checks are there. I mean, it's kind of hard to police anything outside of that. So we're going to pass out guns to everybody. I mean, no, we're going to say pass out guns, guns but hands, I am I'm I'm saying that, you know, people have right to defend themselves. That one that Okay, back to, I don't want to diffuse, but I know you talked about um, gun control and the whole factor of mental illness and everything of that sort, but I don't know if you were aware of this, but it's been a very increase in um, stat here in Chicago of mental hospitals being closed down, and you have been seeing me mental people on the streets, riding the trains and things of that sort, so it's, if they're going to make it a priority to make it where you have to have a mental check to own a gun here in Chicago. Why not make it an ability where they just own handguns instead of like automatic weapons? Well, they, they, they have that in just the entire state. You, yeah. You can't, you can't own one. Again, if you uh, if there's something on your record, the mental health record, you can't own it. What about, yeah. the, what about the funding for mental health? 
clinics and mental health housing for those who need it. And personally, I wouldn't be against that funding for that. And I mean, you look at what Bruce Ronner did, you know, over there on Wilson and Broadway, where I live close to an uptown, a lot of them are on the, on the streets because he said, we're, we're going to cut um, the homeless shelters and the mental health funding, and that doesn't help them get back on their feet. And, you know, when, when it comes to mental health, uh, and even homelessness, you know, this is something that is shunned upon in American society because they're, they're seen as undesires. But, you know, I've worked with groups like NAMI, National Alliance of Mental Illness. I volunteered with them in my early political career. And, you know, they're people too, and they have a voice as well. What essential functions do you think government should do as a libertarian? As a libertarian, well, I, I believe there should be some form of government which is limited. You know, I don't believe they should, uh, that it should be a nanny state where they're taking care of you and, you know, they're trying to get a vote. Uh, you know, I, I, again, I, I'll reiterate, I do believe in some form of taxation. It doesn't need to be much. Um, provide the basic services, you know, and within the libertarian circles, they'll talk about how would you fund the roads, and there's other ways of doing that in, in those conversations, but I do believe in funding the roads through police taxation. Well, is, is Chicago and, and Illinois broke? I mean, pretty close to It's pretty close, yeah. Next to California, right? Yeah. Sad state of affairs. <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, what uh, can Lieutenant Governor do with regards to pensions? And if he can't do anything, what can't like? Sure. What are your thoughts on? Well, the, you know, all I could do in regards to that is like basic influence suggestions. Uh, I don't come up with a budget. That's something that the governor would do, and they would submit it to the General Assembly, and they could battle over that. Yes, sir. Getting back to automatic weapons for a moment, if we may, a large number of uh, gun-related deaths are caused uh, by cops. not deliberately, <laughs> but by accident. Do you, uh, if you're going to put uh, automatic weapons in the hands of uh, the general public, uh, weapons which are designed for only one purpose, and that is killing on a large scale, uh, do you at least require that said individuals be required to demonstrate the same level of competency with those weapons that would be required of the armed forces before they would be allowed to use them. Like gun safety course training? I'm talking about a safety course training uh, and a very rigid one. Well, we already have those, but yeah, I would agree with that. Um, do you know that when they caught AR-15 and AK-47, these are not automatic weapons? It's semi. It's semi-automatic. You can't, you can't get a fully automatic weapon unless you go through the ATF. I think they were banned in the 20s. And you can't in Illinois at all. Yeah. Okay. This is a small question. Yeah. Um, what are your goals and your intentions? Like, what do you try to see change in Illinois, basically? Like, your basis of your my, campaign? My basis of it? Yeah. Well, you know, the office of lieutenant governor uh, is pretty much downplayed for the most part because it's, it's, it's equivalent to, like, the vice president, you know, of the United States because you know, they don't have much clout. I want to go out there and actually hear every citizen's voice and see how I can help them. Even if they I might disagree with me on issues, I like to, I'm a people person, I like to go out there and talk to people, see how we can make the state thrive and be better. Yep. You have three governor choices. Who is the best? <laughs> and why? I have to refrain from that. I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the Green Party and the Libertarian Party seem to be uh, in partnership of uh, trying to start uh, all political party candidates being included in debates locally, state, and federally. Could you talk more about how uh, it's very difficult for the public to make an informed decision and be engaged in the political process with only two parties ever being allowed consistently to the debates and how if we had all the choices of the spectrum, like say for example in Denmark they have 12 different parties in debates, uh, it will make people more involved in civics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well you know, I recently <laughs> talked about this in an interview I had on a radio show in regards to that and the good thing is platforms like Facebook, you know, you have an advertisement, you could pay for it for a cheap, very cheap amount of $5 to promote yourself, as long as they're good, uh, 
Self is too much impulsive. And people will follow the, you know, their, the conversation will start. Because you, you can't really depend on mainstream media or television to do that, because they're always going to be about Democrats or Republicans, and that's what you're stuck with, the choices. But again, you know, we've seen the advancement of uh, technology with the internet again. Mm -hmm. It has helped uh, propel that. And I, I know this sounds old fashioned, but even from my experience campaigning, it's like going door to door talking to people. I mean, it's, you know, again, this is a statewide office I'm doing, but at the same time, showing that you care. And just, you don't even have to talk about your issues, just showing that you care to listen to what they have to say. People appreciate that. This is a quick follow up. Uh, we supposedly, in theory, in the United States, have a vetting process, but uh, a lot of us feel like. Um, and this isn't just to be mean towards him. There's a lot of people who do life's work in psychology feel like he wasn't qualified to be head of state. Could you comment on the vetting process in the United States for, you know, if we're talking about mental health in regards to firearms, I think mental health in regards to having a nuclear arsenal is pretty sure. relevant to that discussion yeah. as well. Well, I, I don't care much for Donald Trump for anyone who knows me. Yeah, I didn't vote for him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a character. Uh, yeah, you know, it's unfortunate that you had a low voter turnout rate. A lot of people didn't like Hillary Clinton either. I mean, you had votes for Gary Johnson, you had votes for Jill Stein. And it shows that a lot of these people who do run, they tend to be very wealthy as well. I think as a society and a culture, we have to move away from just like, oh, they have a lot of money, you know, they, they're our best bet. Because again, you look at the Democrat Party, you know, run for the people who run for governor, Jamie Prisker, a, a billionaire. Does he really represent, uh, you know, progressive values? Oh, he does. He can't relate to the struggles you have or I have. Um, obviously, Bruce Rauner does not. We don't even have to go there with that. Um, but I, I mean, it depends on you know the, the voters. You know, you you could run. You could have a mailman run for president. I mean, some people would look down on that. But I mean, not at all. Not at all. But but again, you know, they they may have some great ideals and they might have served their country. So I I do think that has to be a change in uh, perception. Yep. To uh, follow further on that, uh, doesn't, uh, especially at the top levels of uh, the political jobs in this country, such as the presidency, uh, doesn't it require skill as well as good intentions? I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who have some good ideas and have some very good intentions, but would be absolute disasters when it came to actually running a government. Uh, isn't this vetting process that we have intended, uh, maybe it's not as effective as it might be, intended to uh, get uh, at least qualified people in the arena uh, fighting for those jobs? Yeah, it would be nice to have qualified, realistic people. <laughs> yes. What's your view on uh, that plan, that bill that was passed, uh, which basically was a bailout to Exxon Nuclear? Well, you know, I'm, I'm against any company giving them a bailout. It's uh, just simple short Well, speech. giving them special, basically taxing everyone else to bail them out. No, the taxpayers should have to bail a company. I don't care what company it is. That, you shouldn't be paying them out. Okay. Yep. Yeah, David, you... Uh, it's a basic libertarian uh, position, and you said earlier that uh, basically the best thing situation is less or no government. So therefore... No, I never said no government. I said limited, less government. Limited government. Yeah, so that doesn't mean less. I, I mean, guess doesn't mean, I'm sorry, doesn't mean your no. I'm not, a, I'm not an anarchist. So your assessment of the state of Illinois right now is that Everything is relatively fine, no. and only a little I bit. Of, if it was only fine. a little bit of government. It's not, it's so. It's just where we want it, and limited or a little bit of government is all we need, right? That's right. right. Okay. Next question. Okay. Uh, is, is there a libertarian candidate for governor, and, and who's he? Well, yeah, one of them is here. Patrick is a. It's oh. you. Say, uh, introduce yourself, please. Well, come up and speak. Uh, really, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, come on up and uh, you're... Guys, hey, listen, I was here to support my friend David. I, I don't yeah, want to take the spotlight away from him. We got some time. 
Do you, do you uh, mind if... Uh, do you? Yeah. I mean, uh, come sure. On. Please, come on up. Yay. Yay. Yeah, boy, Doug. Doug, thank you for coming up. We appreciate this. Are you uh, wanting to make an opening statement or take questions right away? How are you doing, folks? My name is Matthew Ciscaro. I am a libertarian running for Illinois governor. I'm running because I think our state is not solvent right now. We need a governor who is going to focus on making the economy of Illinois uh, fiscally feasible at this point. Uh, we have the highest tax burden in the state of Illinois. I'd like to see full marijuana legalization. I'm running to reform pension, reform Medicaid, and I would, uh, I'd like to see term limits imposed as well. Yeah, sure. Any questions? Are you a Cub or Sox fan? Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> I'll get back to that one for a second. How do you plan to make the state solid? No, it's not. The super rich aren't happy to pay their fair share. Yeah, I, I always hear that argument. I don't necessarily think that there's a problem with people being super rich. I think that's the goal of everyone is to become super rich. I think the, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I think that we should be focused on empowering those who are impoverished already and allowing them to achieve wealth. Uh, am I going to fix the state of Illinois? I'm going to cut the expenditures dramatically. I'd also like to see taxes lowered. I'd like to make this a more business-friendly state. I am a Cubs and Sox fan. Uh, when I was a boy, my father used to take me to Comiskey Park. Uh, and then in college, I did live on the north side of Chicago. I used to go for the last three innings. It was $5. You could sit anywhere you wanted. So I like them both, but I'm also an Indians fan. Yes, sir. Could, could you just give us a, like a one-minute summary of the things you would cut in the budget to... Uh uh, cut expenditures, as you say. What, what do you think is bloated in the state of Illinois that well, we can get rid of? Sure, okay. I mean, there's a number of things. And I, I could sit here and talk about how we spend uh, uh, $10 million on the Illinois Wine Growers Association or how we spend $100 million on Illinois.gov. But truly, those are just drops in the bucket. We need to talk about Medicaid reform. We need to talk about pension reform. Those are the two biggest line items for the state of Illinois. And any politician who comes up here and doesn't talk about those two items is quite honestly just being dishonest with you. That is how we solve the problems of Illinois. We have over $200 billion in unfunded liabilities. We have over $16 billion in unpaid bills, and that doesn't include what's not on the comptroller's desk today. If someone's going to be talking about fiscal responsibility, they need to talk about Medicaid, they need to talk about the pension crisis. That's what I'm going to do. What do you got for me? Yeah, I, I didn't find what pension reform is. I mean, I represent civil service employees, sure. and they join, let's say they join, the, they take a job when 18, 20 years old and work 40 some years, and then uh, they decide to retire and go in on Monday, and you're going to say, well, yeah, we told you to get this pension, but we've reformed it. No, I wouldn't say Is that, that and I've never said that. Do? Is that what you're going to do? You looked him in the eye, you know, I mean, you said, you look a man in the eye and you took his hand, you cut a deal. Are you, are, can I shake your hand? Charlie, you you're your creating hand? a straw man. You're making an argument that no one here has ever posed, okay? I never you said that. Want to reform. <laughs> yes, I do want to reform what it. Is that How do I want to reform it? So any new hire should not be put on a pension system. Let's move them to a 403B. That's like a 401K, but for the public sector. Furthermore, I'd like to see people that have an option to buy out their pension if they so like. Maybe move it into a different type of retirement vehicle, like a self-directed IRA so they don't meet the tax implications. But my, the most important thing here is that I want to see people get what they were promised. And the way that it's structured right now, they won't. So we're either going to be realistic and we're going to talk about reforming this so people can get a pension, or, people are, or what's going to happen is it's going to go bankrupt, and that's never happened before, but if we did see what happened to the airlines and the federal scale, the, the federal government came in and they bailed it out and they got paid out 60% on the dollar. I don't want to see that happen. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes. I asked, I asked Lieutenant Governor the question about gun control. I want to know your take on that also. I believe that guns are for shooting tyrants. I don't want to take away the people's rights to own guns. Okay. Thank you. What? How? What? In your opinion, what are the essential functions of government? The essential function of government is to preserve the inherent rights that were granted them by our Creator. That is the role of government. Okay. Yes, Justin. Do public courts uh, and uh, you know justice system count as uh, part of the protecting rights? Uh, quite honestly, I think our judicial system is depriving people of a lot of their rights today. I think that that's a big thing that we need to talk about is judicial reform. 
informing people of jury nullification about their right to say that a law is unjust and to not uh, put someone into a cage for not hurting someone else. So I think that's a huge part. Um, we need to hold the judiciary accountable. Charlie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, boy, Charlie. If I worked for some guys for 40 years, if I worked to make some guy rich, and then I go in Monday to retire, and he says, well, I hope you have set up your own 401k. I take it you don't believe in providing an annuity in retirement. For I'm sorry, what, uh, what you was don't the question? Believe in traditional guaranteed annuity in any fashion. And it's up to the person to provide for their own tax. No, I... The employer has no obligation whatsoever. Charlie, again, these are not things that I've said. What I'm saying is that I think that we should honor the promises that we've made. No matter how outlandish and ridiculous they are, let's find a way to honor them. For anyone moving forward, let's be realistic. If you hire someone today, they're not going to get a pension in 40 years. It's not right. going to be around. So let's not tell them that they're going to. Right. Let's not offer it to them. Let's put them on a 403B. And let's get the government out of managing the money. Why does Illinois manage the money? Why don't we let a third party, the private sector, manage the money? Money managers, that's what they're best at. Yes. When I hear that, when I hear that, and I'm just being respectfully honest, what I hear is code for let's get democracy out of the business of making sure that people who work their whole lives have a quality of life that they've earned. And I'm hearing code when I hear that. Now, correct me, tell me that I'm wrong. What would the code, what's the code for? What is it? The code is you make a promise to somebody when he's 20 or when she's 20, and then when she's 55 or he's 55 or 60, then all of a sudden it's no longer democracy is necessary for us all to have a high quality life, then it's sink or swim. And you can't pull the rug out of somebody who's done everything America's asked for. So correct me if I'm wrong on what I'm feeling I'm hearing in between the lines. You are wrong. So for the third time, folks, I want to keep the pensions that were promised to everyone. Yes. If you have a code, that an answer? if you're hearing anything, you have to have these pensions be invested with managers that knows what they're doing. Exactly. Instead of going to politically correct people, you're going to skim it out for Madigan. Yeah, exactly. I don't want bureaucrats running your pension, your retirement. Has anyone been to the DMV recently? Do you want those people handling your pension? Neither do I. If they were fully funded, actually, I had a good. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I had a good experience at the DMV not too long ago. Sit it out in five minutes. Thought they did a good job. Should they manage hedge funds? No, but they no. certainly can operate a customer service facility well. Exactly. What do you got? The the uh, state supreme court ruled that you can't change these three percent compound interest. These people who retire, they're getting more than the people who work, and they're not doing anything. And the only way you can stop it is to declare bankruptcy like in Detroit. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So what he's referring to, folks, is uh, the, the Illinois state constitution guarantees the value of a pension. And the Illinois Supreme Court has ruled that a lot of these pension reforms that have been proposed are unconstitutional. I think it's a real problem. Um, again, so it's so subjective when you're talking about value. But yes, uh, we do have people who are going to make more in retirement than they did while they're working. We have over 15,000 people who are making over $100,000 per year in pension retirement funds. We have people who are retiring at 55, getting another job, working for the state, then retiring again and getting a second pension. And now they live in Boca Raton, Florida, and are renting out condos. It's not right, it's not solvent, it's immoral. How would you reform Medicaid? That's a great question. That's a big question. So what I would not have done is what Obama, I'm sorry, Obama, Obamacare Medicaid expansion needs to go. This past year in January, the state now had to pick up 5% of those costs. It's triple what we thought it was going to be. Uh, we're looking at an estimated $3 billion by the year 2020. Mm -hmm. We can't do this, folks. It's, I think it's $16 billion is what we're spending a year on Medicaid. Medicaid was, was set up to help those who were disabled, those who were poor, and single mothers. It was not set up so that guys my age could quit their job and go and get health care for free. All right, that's not what it was for. Let's make that system help the people that it was originally set up to help. It, it, it be, five years ago, one in five people was eligible in the state of Illinois for Medicaid. Now it's one in three. We cannot afford it. Okay, you mentioned health care. Now, 
we all can agree that we don't want anyone to go bankrupt because of their health care needs. No matter what end of the spectrum we're on, nobody should go bankrupt. In other countries such as Iceland, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, these countries have agreed that it is in their societal interest to have people have a dignity of life that includes, amongst many things on the list of things you would have, health care, not just health insurance, health care. Now, I think you and I would agree that the Affordable Care Act is not perfect, not very, very well thought out for long-term needs of care. In fact, I would argue it should be the Affordable Insurance Act. Can you see some middle ground here? I know you're a libertarian, so I understand your position very well. You're not going to go all out for becoming Iceland. <laughs> That's a pipe dream on my part. But where's the middle ground where we could agree what we have right now, whether you like the Affordable Care Act or not, whether you like scrapping it and going back to zero or not, what's the middle ground where people who really do need that health care, especially retired nurses and health care providers, Where's the middle ground for them where we could say at least we've tried to give you something better than in the last 50 years? Because going back to zero from the affordable health care sounds to me like going backwards, not yeah, starting over. Well, but in my opinion, Obamacare is the middle ground. And that's quite that's a problem, right? So it's this hedge between socialism and free market capitalism. I'd like to see a free market in health care. If I can't have a free market in health care, and this is something you're not going to hear most libertarians say, I can't have a free market in health care, I want universal health care. Mm. So that's my second choice after a free market, okay? So what this third option, Obamacare, is the absolute worst option. It's the absolute worst option. But there's a lot of things that I want to change here. That things, have been, things, have, things that I believe that we could agree on, like allowing people to buy insurance across state lines. Mm -hmm. I'd like to try to buy pharmaceutical drugs in Canada. You know, um, I think that these are things that could really drive down the costs for people. Okay. But you're absolutely right. It's a huge concern and something needs to be addressed. Yes, sir? Have, have you not, uh, well, can you comment on the difference between uh, market-driven health care and universal health care where it's not a profit driven system. Can I comment on... on no, I mean, are you aware of the difference? You know, all the studies show that you, universal health care where there's no profit motive with billionaires in the middle selling insurance or whatever is you get much more care for people for about half the price of what you pay in a market system like what we have. You do. And this is always what makes a health care system the best health care system. Is it the amount of coverage, the amount of people that get covered, or is it the quality of coverage? I think it's very difficult to deny that America has the best quality health care in the world. It does not have the cheapest health care in the world. I think you have a very valid argument, sir. Well, if you get elected, what, do you propose, uh, what would you propose to do about our current system? I want to allow people to buy health care across state lines. I'd like, to, I'd like to impose Jeffersonian nullification on things like the Affordable Health Care Act. I'd like, like I said, I want to let people buy health insurance coverage, I'm sorry, um, pharmaceuticals across the Canadian border. I'll do anything and everything I can to drive down the cost for people. Yes. Ron, you had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you yes, believe sir. in a means test in that case, so, so that you determine what level of benefits you might receive? Uh, a means test? Means test. Uh, to, to determine what level of health care someone Income, you uh, you know, assets, whatever the... I guess it would depend on... Would be. You know, it would depend on a lot of things. Number one, it would depend on whether we're working in a free market health care system, whether we're working in a universal health care system. And honestly, it would depend on the type of legislation that lawmakers would present to me. Because again, I don't get to write law. I'm, I'm only the governor. I would get to sign law, and I would get to veto law. And then I get to stand up here, and I get to talk about law. Those well, it sounded, like, it sounded like you were saying, you know, the so, rich shouldn't receive for whenever. And all I can tell you folks is that I'll keep an open mind. Um, you know, I, I, I would listen to any any common sense solutions to health care. I have a second question. Please. Do you believe in the legalization of prostitution and what would be the qualifications? Uh, so I don't think that's something I would partake in, but I'm not, I don't like the, the idea of putting someone in a cage who has not hurt anyone else. I don't think that that's morally correct to incarcerate someone and put them into a cage, destroy their life when they haven't hurt anyone else. So let's let's play that out. So well, the FBI has been waging would a war on prostitution oh, yeah. for years. <laughs> now. I, I, I'm just going to explain why. I mean, because it, it's it sounds odd when I say, "Yeah, let's legalize prostitution." I'm not condoning prostitution. I don't think that anyone grows up and says, "Yes, I want to be a prostitute." They go there because they're impoverished. Something horrible is happening in their life, right? So, but 
let's let's add insult to injury. So we arrest that person. Now they have a felony on their record. Now when they get out, they can't get a job. They're more likely to go on welfare. Once and it, it, it can be welfare. It, maybe you can't get welfare. Yeah, you're right. So maybe they're more likely to get incarcerated again. And that's a cyclical system. And that's horrible. And I don't think that those type of people should be treated like criminals. I think those type of people generally have a health concern. And that's how we should treat them. Okay. Charlie. Huh. Yeah, the uh, state of Illinois has cut back on its contribution for public transit in the metropolitan area, which will result in an increase in fare and cut in service for Metro Pace and CTA. Does that concern you in any way, shape, or form? Or would you change that? Yeah, I think that uh, transportation be handled by the private sector. I know Blago wanted to make it free for everyone. That's not my thing. CTA so, used to be free. You, wait a minute. You want to sell CTA? Uh, I'm not opposed to selling CTA. I think we need to sell all the assets we can. I think we should rename Illinois Amazon.com. So you want to sell CTA to some private company? What do you got? Yeah, uh, the fact is that uh, the transit systems were private in the beginning. Yeah, and I bet they worked a lot better, too. Well, that's why they, were, <laughs> they went out of business. Did they go out of business? I don't know. That's Listen, Charlie, I'll look into it, but I'll tell you right now. I mean, transportation, I thought that's another sucking chest wound for the state of Illinois. <laughs> you mentioned Jeffersonian nullification. Yeah. So it got me thinking of, uh, uh, of federalism, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. How can uh, people on the right, people on the left, use those kind of principles to uh, achieve whatever ends that they want? That's a, that's a big question. Um, so essentially, you know, what you're talking about is the rights that are not contained within the Constitution are the rights of the people and the states respectively, and that the government, the federal government, is contained to only those rights that are enumerated within the Constitution. So how can we use those rights? I think that we need to understand that the federal government right now is imposing a lot of laws which they really have no place in doing. They have really no place in telling states, for instance, how to handle their health care services. Um, there's, again, time and time again, you know, FDA, EPA, uh, a lot of these things just should not have federal oversight. And I don't want to get into a big long diatribe on this, folks. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great question, Justin. If I if I got more than three hours of sleep, I'd make a better answer for you. <laughs> All right. Yes, sir. Many people today think that the number one problem facing America, other than climate change, is what the media aren't talking about with Trump packing the courts with politicians masquerading as judges, uh -huh. or right-wing politicians that are groomed as lawyers through the Federalist Society. Are you familiar with that and what's going on there? Uh, well, a judge, in theory, should not be partisan in the least. They should not be right or left. They should be only there to interpret and judge the law. In theory, but how do you address the problem we got right now with these right-wing wackos like Clarence Thomas and some of these others? masquerading as judges and they produce a report, you know, they can give you a Citizens United ruling. I don't think My bigger problem with the Supreme Court is the fact that they don't ever do anything revolutionary. They only listen to what other Supreme Court justices throughout the past did. So as far as right-wing wackos, I don't know, maybe there's a few on there. I'm not really sure. That's my bigger problem with them, though. Do something. Would you pardon Lago? Hmm. You know, honestly, I feel like he... I, look, I'm no Blago apologist. I'm not. But I feel like he got a longer sentence than he should have. Yeah. I don't think he got paid, did he? I don't think he even got any money out of that whole thing. We have people who have killed people and get half the time. They get, they're out now. They've killed a man. You know, um, I, I listened to Blago recently. I read he was in the newspaper, and you know, it's he's got this heartwarming story about how he's washing the floors and this and that. And I, you know, I'm thinking, look, the horse trading that was going on, that was nothing new, right? He was not doing anything new, but um, I don't know if I'd pardon him. But I, I might say, hey, listen, let's let the guy out. I don't want to pay for him in, in jail any longer. Clemency, right? Yeah, maybe that's what, yeah. Okay. Um, seeing as how. turn. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. When the waitress and the bus boy, they don't make a lot of money, can't afford cars, but when they get done with work tonight, uh -huh. And the way they get home, apparently, if your governor isn't of any concern to you. I don't, again, think that I said that, Charlie. That's not what I said. I'm <laughs> asking you all. I said, 
Well, there was an assumption. They're and and it is. You while they get home. I think that they're going to find a way home. I mean, what, what, what would your proposal be? That we have free transportation for everyone? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, listen, we can afford it, folks. Let's just put out another credit line for the state of Illinois. Guys, thank you so much for listening to me. My name is Matthew Siscaro, Libertarian for Illinois right. Governor. Appreciate it. Any further follow up? Because what we'll do is we'll go to rebuttals now. Let's thank both of our speakers tonight. All right, around, we got guys. still, hang we came around. around because we, you'll get the last word. Right. We'll be here till about quarter, we get out at quarter to nine. We've got an open mic. We'll go five minutes per speaker. Let's get up there and get rebutting. Yes. All right, sure, let's get up there and get rebutting. Everybody gets five minutes. Let's another hand for our speakers, please. And you guys will get the last word. Why don't you get up there and rebut, dude? You go, you, yeah, go ahead. You got five minutes. Thank you to uh, both the speakers for a very interesting talk. Um, for the first time in 35 years, we don't have a, a Bush or a Clinton as head of state, vice president, or secretary of state in the United States. And uh, that presents a good opportunity, whether uh, we realize it or not, for working class and middle class communities to re-envision what this country's got to be in the 21st century. So uh, I am very receptive to any new ideas. However, my strong and respectful disagreement to tonight's speakers is I think they're presenting us things that are presented as new ideas that aren't new ideas. For those of us who have uh, remembered living also with a single mother or a single father in the 1980s, voodoo economics was one of the worst policy ideas in the history of the United States of America. It never trickled down to working class and middle class communities. So. Uh, respectfully, I would ask li our Libertarians, brothers and sisters, to rethink that history and how it relates to their current uh, proposals. When I read the Constitution of the United States of America, uh, it says, We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general war welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish the Constitution for the United States of America. Um, you know, it's pretty basic and simple. It doesn't say, it doesn't mention bailouts for those who gambled away our pensions. It doesn't say offshore tax havens for the super rich. It doesn't say that a very small number of individuals should have as much wealth as half the planet. Uh, corporate corporatism. I'm not going to get an argument of over capitalism because I think I know where we stand on this. But corporatism, you know, greedism. I'm getting mine, and you're going to have to live in a shelterism if you didn't happen to win the lottery. You have a billion or a friend. That's something we can all agree on. Uh, the founders, if they were still here today, if we had that time machine, would be furious and would have these guys on all those boats and planes that we have funded with our tax dollars for uh, the most funded military in the world to the International Court in The Hague, stat. If they saw what corporate America has wreaked havoc on our communities, and I think a lot of what I heard tonight, you agree with that. So I don't think we're necessarily in disagreement on a lot of these things. Um, I brought a flyer tonight. It's by David K. Johnston. It says, nine reasons Trump's tax plan will hurt you. A scheme of the super rich by the super rich for the super rich. Uh, DCReport.org. Please, everybody, get one. Uh, it's a two-page summary of why they're just banking on you and I having no historical memory of what happened in this country. It never trickles down. Okay, there's great PR to say it will. It never does. What about Article 1, Section 8? That's a great that? point. You can bring it up in your rebuttal. Okay. On the dotted line, don't ever sign. 
The print is fine, the system lies. For the new normal, don't buy. For the new Jim Crow, don't seek high. On the Donald line, don't ever sign. The script's on fire, the system lies. For the new, can't beat them, so let's join them, don't be pacified. For the new, can't jail them, slave for them, don't fall, rise. Um, I would urge everybody uh, in this country to just join together on things that we do agree on, uh, where there's middle ground, and not go to extremes at this point in time, because we've got the global rich in a checkmate if we just find our solidarity on the things we do agree on, and that's why I'm very happy to hear the speakers uh, voice their ideas tonight, even though I do strongly disagree with many of them. I want to thank the speakers for their presentation. I didn't agree with any of it. I'm an old-time Chicago and Cook County Democrat who believes that big government is good. But little government or no government is bad. Uh, with regard to Jefferson nullification, we fought a long and bloody civil war in the 19th century that, that should have settled the question of nullification once and for all. Uh, that's number one. With regard to selling off assets such as the CTA, the whole reason why the CTA was started in the first place was because private companies which previously had been providing public transit couldn't make any money. And they were going uh, belly up right and left throughout the whole country, in Chicago, in Washington, D.C., and in other cities. That's why the states were eventually forced to take over commuter rail operations, and that's why we have Amtrak. Nobody could make any money doing this. Uh, with regard to the comment that rich people don't know how to identify with poor people and so on, shouldn't be president or whatever, to some extent that's true. But is it true in every case? I can think of at least, at least two great presidents who were wealthy people and who worked hard at solving this country's problems and making things better for the average citizen. And one of them was named Franklin Roosevelt, and the other was named John Kennedy. So I'm sorry, I don't mean by the argument that there should be a means test to exclude people from public office. And in fact, Abraham Lincoln, for example, worked hard to move into the, to at, at, to at the very least, the upper middle class. Uh, with regard to the comments that we should be lenient on poor old Rod Blagojevich, he knew what he was doing was a crime and he did it anyway. In President Obama's shoes, the most I would have done was reduce his sentence from 14 to 10 years. And with regard to those folks who say either we should let him go altogether or we should have some mercy on some kid who gets pinched because he's got a gun that he knows he shouldn't have, well, when I was in college back in the 70s, there was a TV show called Beretta. And its theme song didn't originally have lyrics, but during the second season, they added some for Sammy Davis Jr. sang. And the lyrics included the lines, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Don't roll the dice if you can't pay the price. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Oh, I'm going to go early tonight. All right, Charlie. All right, you guys yeah. 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 Well, let's thank both our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, young man. Good luck on your campaigns. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Why did we have a health care situation in the United States? And we covered this topic over the years at the college complexes. At one time we began, there were only a few, if I remember, five million people in the United States that did not have health insurance because it was provided for by their employer. And over the years, fewer and fewer employers provided insurance as a condition of employment. And they got out of the figures, kept going up, we kept revisiting it, until it got up to 50 million, and then 100 million. For 100 million people either had no insurance or uninsured. Generally, one or more of the providers in the nuclear family were health insurance through their employment, and were able to take care of the nuclear family. But employers wanted to get out of that. We know that negotiating union contracts. What else did they get out of? Sick days, uh, 
um, uh, vacation days, overtime pay, uh, and most of all, retirement. It used to be you work 40 years to make some guy rich, and now he says, thank you very much, see you around sometime, pal. That's what you get. That's the free market capitalist economy. That's why you have problems here. And no, that's, and just turning the entire nation over to this free market economy, and then to say, well, then we, here you got a problem, because you come along and say, well, no government, no government, but the free market's getting out of the US, business is providing this, and yet you don't want, so the individual somehow is supposed to do all this. I don't know how. There's an internal contradiction there. All right, let's go on to another one here. All right. All right, transportation. <laughs> uh, half a million people, at least more like 600,000, depend on the public transit infrastructure to get to and from work to keep our economy going. This is a very utilitarian thing. Uh, apparently, the parties that I've heard tonight think everybody should get their own vehicle, uh, <laughs> I guess, and provide for their own. Somehow there's going to be a private sector uh, thing. The thing that's thing is they don't realize is that you've got to avoid a transit system that they can't understand anything other than a, having a transit system with a fare box. Well, there's about 25 different ways of funding a municipal service <coughs> other than taking it out as a regressive tax on the working poor, people who are trying to simply provide for their own and be good citizens. And you say, no, you're going to have this surcharge uh, to, to get to and from work. This is not a, a choice matter. Um, it's a tragic situation that there's no public transit right now to and from this location. Um, and yet, people running for office don't even know about that, nor apparently care. <laughs> How it is a very real thing, the employees of this establishment right now have no way to get home unless they're planning on doing some walking. And if they're lucky, they're going to find one of the transit lines that's still in operation. All right, last of all, you got to be cool, man. I heard a disparaging remark that certain civil service employees of an agency were lacking in qualifications. <laughs> <laughs> or something like this. And I kind of think they are very hard working, the hardest working people in the United States. And each of us, as a resident of the state in Illinois, should thank them for what they do each and every day in running this very complex state and keeping things going. That's they're 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 number one in my book. Thank you. All right, now let's All right. Yeah. Mr. Don Ritchie. Yeah. Yeah. Five, Don Ritchie. Five minutes, Mr. Don. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Well, I thought this is a really interesting presentation. First of all, I'm, I'm actually glad to see that there is a libertarian candidate uh, running for governor. You know, I don't agree with the libertarian party. Um, I agree with them on some issues, not on others. But I am glad to see that there's someone running, because I think, I think one of the big problems in this country is the two-party system, uh, which really limits who can run. And it also limits you know, what's often called the Overton window, what can, you know, that, that that there's only the, the, the media treats acts like there's only two parties, Republican and Democrat, and there, sure there are a lot more choices, but and but we're limited uh, by uh, by the fact that there's only two parties. Um, there now that being said, there's there are a few areas where I would um, disagree with uh, with the Libertarian candidate. But one of the things I know he mentioned, um, he mentioned that um, uh, on, the, on the subject of guns, he mentioned that. Um, on, on, on all the people who are killed with knives in the United Kingdom. It certainly is true that you can kill somebody with a knife, but you can kill a lot more people simultaneously if you have an AR-15, because you can shoot on whole, you know, you can shoot on a whole lot of bullets. Those bullets travel a lot further than even a thrown knife will, and so it's a much better way of killing large numbers of people. Uh, and so now, um, and now. 
I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about the Second Amendment. See, the Second Amendment, but the NRA likes to likes to quote the Second Amendment out of context, saying yeah. the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, the full amendment says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. You know, it mentions uh, militia. And what people don't understand about the Second Amendment is that when that was written in the 1790s, the state militias, what's now called the National Guard, wasn't under the control of the federal government the way it is the way it is now, or just like another branch of the armed forces. At that time, it was actually under the control of the governor. Uh, in many in, in many states, uh, every able-bodied man was required to be a member, and uh, in other states, it was voluntary. But uh, typically, a member of the state militia uh, would keep his own rifle at home. Uh, they were under the control of an adjutant general who was appointed by the governor of the state. Uh, you kept your own rifle, your own your own ammunition, and your own your own powder and other supplies at home. And um, and and there would typically be for each county a um, uh, uh, a cannon crew. They would they would often keep a cannon on the on the uh, courthouse lawn, which is where that tradition of having a cannon on the courthouse lawn comes from. And and they were responsible for maintaining maintaining that artillery. And it's all totally different now. America's completely changed from that time. And, and, and so the Second Amendment is talking about an America in the 1790s that doesn't exist anymore. Now, on the subject of, um, you know, somebody, our, the libertarian candidate for governor, talked about Medicaid recipients as if they're all, as if they're all people who made a conscious choice to be unemployed. The truth is that most Medicaid recipients and most recipients of so-called welfare, such as which, such as um, let's say, uh, let's say food stamps, actually have jobs. However, if you have a minimum wage job, it does not, given the cost of living today, it does not pay you enough to live on, especially not in a city like Chicago. And so, and so most of the people who most of the people who get Medicaid have jobs because healthcare is simply too expensive for them. And so, and in any case, the only requirement for eligibility now is that your income be below a certain level. There's no requirement that you be unemployed. All right. And by the way, I'm one of those people who has Medicaid because my uh, my income is high enough for me to um, to be able to buy private insurance. So um, now, on the subject of privatization, privatization. If you have privatization on the scale where, for example, you give everything out to private companies, then basically the private companies will become the government. And so instead of having a government that we can elect, if we don't like the people who are running our government, we can vote in some new people. And I'm all for that. But if the same thing is provided by a corporation, you can't vote them out. And another thing about a corporation is that the government cannot go, the government cannot go out of business. Most private businesses do go out of business. Now, some people are talking about whether to pardon Blagojevich. This is completely moot. As Russell said earlier, Blagojevich got federal charges, and consequently only the President of the United States can pardon him. All right. Get up there and uh, rebut. Pardon the the Honorable Pedler. The well, Honorable. Not quite Honorable, but anyway. <laughs> thank you for the compliment. Um, one of the things that uh, the libertarians <clears throat> like to talk about is term limits. Now, consider this. There are any number of public officials in Illinois, state legislature, who have labored at their tasks for years and years and gotten very good at it. Some of you who live here on the north side will know uh, the name of uh, Sarah Fagenholz, yes. who has gotten very good on health and human services issues. Now, I don't know about anyone else in this room. I can tell you that I am one hell of a lot better at my job now than I was 8, 10, or 12 years ago. And the same is true with many of the, not all, perhaps, many 
of the long-serving public officials. Uh, they have learned their craft. They have learned in many places that <coughs> service to the public is the only thing that keeps them in office in many cases. So, just as a guy is getting his stride, just as a guy is beginning to learn the job, just as the guy is finally learning at least the rudiments of where the washrooms are, he is suddenly turned out. And we put an amateur in there. Now, we all watched, many of us watched Ted Mack's Amateur Hour. It was charming. It was fun. However, would you, if you were in an accident, in an emergency room, fighting for your life, would you want some guy a year out of medical school patching you up, or would you want some guy who has done that job on cases just like yours for 20 years or so? I think you're going to want the experienced person. If you're on trial for your life, would you want a lawyer just out of law school, or would you want a guy who has done these kinds of cases for years and years and years? I think we know the answer to that, because if you get in deep trouble and you need uh, and you're charged with a serious crime, you want somebody who can do the job well and take care of your interests. Otherwise, you aren't going to need a lawyer. You're going to need a priest. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you know we can't. This is not amateur hour. You don't run a government. Uh, you know, learning on the job. You become efficient at government by serving for a period of time, learning the ins and outs of it, and also learning the importance of serving your constituency. Now, grant you, there are a certain number of people who take advantage of it. This is their gravy train. They're totally irresponsible. These are not the kind of people who should be in government in the first place. But for the people that seriously went into government with the extent of service to the people, and there are many. Again, I cite Sarah Fagenholz as a, as a classic example. When you have people like that, it is not in the public interest to say, okay, Sarah, you've served your, your time, uh, you know, go home and uh, uh, do something else. No. You want to value experience. You need experience. You need people who, are know, who know what they're doing. And, you know, really, sure, on paper to a certain type of person, the Libertarian Party may appear to be a wet dream come true. However, let's move to the CTA. 150, 170 years ago, it used to be customary to pay the fire department for putting out your fire. We don't do that today. We have a fire department that comes, does the job, and it comes out of your taxes. You pay for it. Uh, we have the best trained in Chicago, probably the best trained fire department, or one of the best trained in the United States. It's paid for out of your taxes. You're not going to have a fireman coming up saying, <coughs> Give me, the, give, me, give me the money, ubi est mea. No. You're going, to find, you're going to find that certain services go with being a resident in Chicago and indeed in the United States. So, the CTA has become a vital, very vital uh, uh, thing for many people who don't own cars for a number of reasons. Maybe they choose not to own cars. Maybe they live in the center of town and they don't need a car. But you do need some form of public transportation. And you do need uh, affordable public transportation. We can't afford to start treating the CTA like, uh, oh, uh, you know, certain certain other businesses that people can take it or leave it. This is something, uh, you know, look, uh, you go to a hospital, yeah, you're going to get a bill maybe 
if you don't have the money, if you can't pay it, they're still going to treat you. And I'm, incidentally, I'm seeing that uh, my uh, time is up. If you want to discuss this later sometime, I'll be glad to do it. I'm far from finished. Thank you. All right. All right. Who's next? I did take the CTR. All right. <laughs> All right. You next? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Five minutes. And let's wait and hear what you got to say. Remember, it's going out on YouTube. So. Oh, it is. Yes. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Demetria. Um, I'm from the south side of Chicago, so I ride the train, the blue line, and the red just to get here, and I see the problems that goes on on the train. So, I believe that public transportation should be free. People are, you have homeless people living on the train, you have mentally ill patients that's, that's messing with riders on the train, you have people using the train, the CCA train as a public bathroom, so it's many of causes, many of things that's happening on the train, and for me, I believe it should be free. Like he said, it comes out our, our taxpayers' dollars. I'm going to move on to um, gun control. I live on the south side of Chicago, so I'm in the realm of gun violence basically and you hear of all the things that goes on people dying from senseless violence and it should be a, a type of um, thing in place for where they can't get weapons and soon as someone soon as someone kills someone they they're quick to blame the person hold, holding the gun instead of blaming the governor officials who allow these guns into these communities. Mm -hmm. I feel like they should they should be responsible should be held responsible for that instead of giving giving a 17 year old 17 years or 10, 10 to 15 years for repeated gun charges when how is he having how is he getting access to these guns? If if you make trickle gun 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 laws is gonna eliminate the the factor of them getting a weapon. Um, as far as like the youth of Chicago, I feel like um, that they need someone that's, they need more programs in the communities where they can um, have an outlet to go to. They're, they're cutting back on school funding. I went to both charter and public school and I saw a big difference in that. I went to public school for elementary school and we were being taught out of books that was older than I were. And, and that was ridiculous. When I went to a charter high school, I saw a big difference. I was learning about things that I never had learned in a public school. So I feel like that they need to find a spectrum where instead of closing these schools down, turn around the cu curriculum, make the curriculum where, adopt the, the charter school curriculum where allowing teachers to have the freedom to design their own curriculum instead of going based off the same curriculum year after year. Um, far as like just urban communities in general. Like I come all the way up here just to get um, a lesson from you all. Like I learned a lot just being here for these, these well, past thank Saturdays. You. Thank and you. there is nothing like this on the South Side. There's At nothing all. like this that's gonna educate um, youth on like what's going on in the United States, what's going on in politics, what's going on in our country. And I feel like that if we had more things of this sort where it's like you guys are our mentor, me and my friends, like you guys are our mentor and you're pouring out your uh -huh your um, knowledge to us because to be to be frankly about it, we are, we are the future generation. Um, and we are how the United States is going to be, how the country is going to be in the future. So if we're not, if we're not grabbing the knowledge that we, and the wisdom that we can now, you're looking at a country that's going to be exactly how it is now. It's, it's, it's not going to change. So that's, it's, I don't think that really was considered a rebuttal. It was just Thank you. No, but that, that's it. Thank you. You guys are my mentor. I'll, uh, God help us all, Trey. God help us all. <laughs> you guys are my mentor. Oh, boy. That's a future thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you for all your comments so far, and uh, thanks to our our two speakers that came tonight to give us their impressions. <clears throat> My comment, I, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Uh, once said, "Any society that spends more on military and machinery of death." 
that it spends on social uplift programs is headed toward you know, spiritual death and extinction as a society. And that's where we are today. The number one problem facing America, other than climate change facing the world and being the most critical problem on the planet, the number one problem facing America is the enormous amount of money, taxpayers' money, that should be spent on schools, health care, roads, education, higher education, uh, all kinds of things. Over a trillion dollars, over a trillion when you add it all up, is going into what is now known globally as the largest environmental destruction and killing machine on the planet. That's the U.S. military. The U.S. military is not fighting for freedom and justice anywhere. As a country, we are divided. Patriotic people fall into two basic groups. Some that are living inside the bubble of mythology created by the media, and the others that have step, what I call stepped through the barrier. They've escaped. <clears throat> and they're seeing the world through uh, clearer eyes without, without living in a mythological bubble. And we've just come through an incredible amount of flag waving, honor the troops, respect the troops. Uh, you can't watch a halftime ceremony in any sporting event, NBA or NFL, without uh, the military flag waving and glory. You know, there, there wasn't this kind of glorification of the military when I was growing up. The reason they have to keep glorifying it, the reason they built a monument in, uh, in not to 9-11 in New York is to keep a myth going, you have to have monuments and people worshiping these things because the cat's been out of the bag since September 12th. Um, <laughs> Professor Griffin Professor Griffin wrote in his latest book, Bush and Cheney, How They Ruined America and the World, came out a few months ago. He said, 15 years later, the pall of poison smoke from that day still hangs low over us all. The great mission for the remainder of this century is plain. We must get out from under the control mechanism September 11th has become. The argument of this book is that we will not get out from under it unless the big lie of 9-11 is publicly exposed. 9-11 was a giant poisonous tree that was planted deep into the psyche of this country on September 11th. And we have Homeland Security, we have the militarization of the police, we have police in these various towns thinking that they have freedom just to step out of their car and blow somebody away, most likely a minority person. None of that would have been remotely possible and accepted by the general public unless we're living under this all-consuming uh, security type philosophy of, well, we have to be safe against terrorists and our military has to be hunting for terrorists all over the world. Well, the military is not hunting for terrorists. They are creating terrorists with the drones so that there are some pockets of people wanting to kill Americans whenever we invade their country to try to steal their oil and resources. That's what's going on. But that's not in the news, as I pointed out a bunch of times. Another thing that's not in the news is books like what Richard Wolff has just written. The concept of inequality that uh, many economists have written as the gap between the rich and the poor gets wider, society begins to disintegrate. And the gap between the super rich and the poor in this country is the widest that it's ever been in this country. And the, when I was growing up, the ratio of CEO pay to workers' pay was 10 to 1 or 20 to 1. Now it's 300 or 500 to 1. Yeah. Uh, the people in Japan got nervous about inequality when their CEOs of companies were making 11, 12 times as much as the average worker. They consider it immoral to consider, well, John McMurtry wrote a book, a Canadian author, he published a book called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. He said if you let psychopathic people with no ethics, morals, and conscience if you allow them to become billionaires, then they will rise to the top. They'll get bigger like sharks and they'll eat everything in sight, which is what we've got with billionaire predators in America today. If we don't address that problem fundamentally, then there is no hope for the generation of people that this young lady talked about. Uh, you know, people her age and uh, the children a few years younger, they have no future. If we don't do something about climate change, 
and this militarization of America, then there, there's no viable future for people living in America unless you're a billionaire and can you know, afford your own private house. So, as I said before, start uh, a good place to start. All of you that have internet access, just start logging onto the website Common Dreams. It's a news site that posts the best of the best news every day without all the garbage. If you want to be, you know, learn what's going on in America, log on to Common Dreams and uh, Truth Out and the Smirking Chimp. Those are three great sites. So we give you links to hundreds of other sites where all this good information comes from. Thank you all. Sometimes the solutions to things like climate change are as plain as day. Yes, I'm going to mention it. Imagine your lifetime supply of energy in a glass about this full of fluid. Imagine if your glass was this full of something called an element called thorium. And there are ways of harnessing nuclear power safely and getting rid of our nuclear waste and getting rid of the spent fuel that's accumulating around the world. The solution is called the Liquid Fluoride Molten Salt Reactor, LFTR, if you want to Google it. The claim I make to some of you who maybe have heard this for the first time is it may be fantastic or preposterous, but I invite all of you to take a look at your smartphone and put in thorium power. You'll find a site at Harvard, Illinois called the Thorium Energy Alliance. And what it will tell you is that we do need baseload power to combat climate change. Over a period of 30 years, the entire city of Chicago could be powered by <coughs> a fluid the size of a basketball of thorium and be sequestered for less than 400 years. And then Fukushima. And Fukushima, Charlie, was a bad design reactor, but the radiation there is not as harmful as you may think. It's less than background. We're not going to get into this right now. The second thing that you... One fall at a time. And Chernobyl, it's another myth and a lie that you can take a look at if you look at the original reports. Yeah. And Andy, I'm sorry, but I don't agree with you on 9-11. But we don't have to go there. As I'm looking more at your evidence, the more convinced I'm becoming of the government reports. Now, the one thing that you guys don't understand is that, and what doesn't make the news, is if you look at a book by Richard Norberg called Progress, we have made more progress in the last 75 years with the creation of wealth, with the elimination of extreme poverty, and with getting the world to be a generally more civil place. Now I know we have problems, I know we have now the 24-hour news cycle, and I know things, but generally I think our lives are getting much better than they were. And you know, for me, the biggest solution to helping the poor is giving them an opportunity to run a business, or to run, uh, give them a helping hand so they can become entrepreneurial, or get a better job. It's going to take education. It's going to take some role of government involvement to, to let you learn those skills. And that means we're going to require some investment in public education. Defense, we all know that this has been addressed many a times already. At the end of the, the, uh, who, the military industrial complex, who was that? Eisenhower. Eisenhower. At the end of the Eisenhower administration. And if you remember, it was his administration that took the investment of the Interstate Highway Act to help get America moving and trading a lot faster. There is a role that government can do and a role that they can't do. Now when I hear about, a lot about privatization of the railroads and things like this, Britain right now was a really good idea. But now since the contracts have a monopolistic control over one route, the companies are now starting, the ticket prices have gone up quite a bit and the service level has gone down, and, and they are yearning now back for the times of British Rail. Take a look on the web, you'll find a lot of this very fascinating. 
Now, I'm going to sum this up with very simple. The solutions are out there. Don't be buffaloed or take it into account that you can't solution. Charter schools are a start, but you're right. We do need funding for public schools. You know, but how do you do that when you have a declining enrollment in the city of Chicago? Maybe I'm a little bit more um, optimistic because I come from the suburbs. My suburb of Algonquin has had a balanced budget for the last 14 years in a row. Has won awards for things. But you know, and another thing they do is they put their general ledger online. <coughs> Every expenditure that they make, every accounting thing that they do, you can find it in their financial documents. Perhaps, maybe, if we be cut this level of transparency for every taxing body in the country, it might help <coughs> bring a lot more accountability to government. Who's going to read that? Uh, Charlie, a lot will, because, you know, well, the whole thing in Dixon, Illinois would have probably been avoided if they'd have had an online legend. Oh, wow. Anyway, yeah, next speaker, please. All right. Yes. 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 Um, all right. Since we do not have any more rebuttals or rebutters, will our speakers please come up and give us your last word? Yay. No. Speakers get the last word. And that includes you too. Okay? I gotta get home to read the government ledger. <laughs> Good. It'd be, a, it'd be a start, Charlie. Yeah. Oh, right. Might educate yeah. yourself sometime. And he needs all the education he can do. <laughs> no, Charlie's a good uh, he keeps this place running, so we yeah, gotta I give him a know. round of applause. Just want to simply say uh, I appreciate everyone coming out here and Thank you for the lively debate and <laughs> questioning. Um, I don't know where to how to end this. I mean, just say what's on your mind. What's on my mind. Thank you. I don't know. I guess, I guess my only thought on you know term limits is I'm I'm going to generally be for it because you know after all it's a public sector job. This is not for you to get rich off the land, as many of these politicians do. You can't compare them to doctors and nurses and lawyers because those are private sector jobs. So. I'm, I, How do we get a hold of you and tell us the office you're running for? Okay, so I'm running for Lieutenant Governor for, with the Libertarian Party. Uh, my website is www.dew, like do, for uh, politics.com. Uh, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter and all that fun stuff. And yeah, I'll still be around and talk to a few of you if you're interested. But I want to say thank you all so much, and I have nothing else to say. Okay. So one question on term limits. Seriously, we've had it. No. Are there any studies on term limits? All right, come on up and uh, give us your Good. end pitch. When do they go bad? Folks, again, my name is Matthew C. Scarrow. I am a libertarian running for Illinois governor. I don't generally speak without being prepared, but I, uh, I really do appreciate this opportunity coming up here and speaking in front of you folks. Thank you so much for hosting this, for allowing my friend David to speak, and for, for hearing out our radical alternative thoughts. Um, so, you know, we talked about a number of issues today, whether it was public transportation, whether it was taxation rates, whether it was health care, and it's quite obvious that we disagree on the solutions, but I can guarantee you that all of our hearts are in the same place, and that's that we want the best thing for all the people here. Um, again, I, I just really appreciate this group and how you conduct yourselves. I think that the United States needs more of this. When I watch TV and I hear two talking heads who don't disagree, they interrupt each other, they call each other's names, it's all ad hominem. I appreciate civil discourse and I appreciate the opportunity. Once again, my name is Matthew C. Scarrow, Libertarian for Illinois Governor. Please talk to me afterwards if you want to find out more information. Your website for our web people. M-C-S, the number four I-L. It's my initials, M-C-S, the number four I-L. Thank you so much. Take care. Give a shout, Andy. All right. All right. Uh, once again, give a big hand to both of our speakers tonight. Thank you both for coming. We enjoyed it, and we're officially uh, gaveled out for tonight, and we'll see you all next week. Happy uh, Thanksgiving. What's on the schedule for next weekend? I'm speaking next week. Okay. Is Trump a capitalist or another mooch at the public trough? <laughs> So for those of you that aren't up to date on the information about Donald Trump, you will get an earful 
next week. Okay? Thank you all for coming. Good night.